One of the cool theorems that we learned about was that the inverse image of a regular value is always a manifold. And if you're mapping from an m-dimensional, or let's say n-dimensional manifold, to an m-dimensional manifold, then the dimension of the inverse image of a regular value will be the difference of the dimension of the codomain minus the dimension of the range. In particular, if the dimensions happen to be the same, so let f be differentiable and m and n both m-dimensional manifolds. And by differentiable, I mean here ck for some k. Then the inverse image of a regular value for f, so here r is a regular value, is a one-dimensional manifold. Sorry, is a zero-dimensional manifold. In fact, it's a submanifold of n. Zero-dimensional manifolds are basically just unions of points. Because a single point is closed as a subset of the target space, then the inverse image, because f is continuous, is also going to be a closed subset of n. If n happens to be compact, then the inverse image of a regular value will always be a finite set. Is a finite subset. of n. So it's just a finite number of points in n. This observation is very important for what's about to come. So I'll leave the proof of that to you as an exercise. I sort of outlined it just now. And instead, let's make another assumption. And that assumption is that m is connected. And for a manifold, it turns out that connected holds if and only if path connected holds. So we can think of when M is connected instead of the definition in terms of open sets and separations, we can just think any two points can be connected by some path. So if we assume M is connected as well, then we can define for any such map F the degree of F at a regular value r, remember we denoted this set by rf, so this is the degree of f at r, is, so let, let's just look at this for a second. At a regular value, the inverse image, we can look at those points, and those are some of the regular points of f, and on those points, the differential maps onto the tangent space. So every single vector in the image gets hit um, under this map. And in particular, since the dimensions of m and n are the same, linear transformation between two finite dimensional spaces of the same dimension is an isomorphism if we know that that map is onto. So because it's an isomorphism, we can compare the two orientations. So let's actually say, not only are these m-dimensional manifolds, but let's say they're oriented m-dimensional manifolds, then the degree of f at r is the sum of the signs of these orientations over the inverse images of the regular value. So sine x here, oh, that should be just sine, this quantity here is just plus 1 if dxf 
which is a linear transformation from the tangent space at x of n to the tangent space, well here, f of x is r, so we can write r m. If this linear isomorphism is orientation preserving, or this sign is negative 1 otherwise, so if it's orientation reversing. And because this set of points is finite, provided that at least n is compact, then this sum is finite and we're just adding a bunch of plus and minus 1s. And we call this the degree of f at a regular value. It's a pretty big theorem that the degree of f actually doesn't depend on the choice of the regular value. The degree of f, using the same notation as we had above, of r equals the degree of f at another regular value, let's say r prime, for all r, r prime regular values. Proving this is not easy at all, um, and we're actually not going to prove it for now. Uh, maybe if we have time later, uh, I'll indicate how to prove this. But it involves some uh, heavy machinery and something known as Sard's theorem, for instance. And Sard's theorem essentially tells us that the set of critical points um, is a set of measure zero. Even though this particular theorem is difficult to uh, prove, um, a simpler version uh, is not so difficult to prove. And let me write that on the below here. The degree of f as a function of its input, which is the points of regular, uh, the set of regular values, is locally constant. And what this means is that if I have any regular value here, then what I can do is there exists an open set around that regular value on which this function is constant. Um, this is a much stronger condition. It says that I can take all of these open sets, piece them together, and you'll still get a constant function overall. So with this definition, we can now go back and think about vector fields again. And we can use this idea to calculate, or rather provide an invariant of critical points that depends on the degree of some particular function. So here I'll, I'll draw a picture on the side very frequently. So first let's uh, have a definition. And by the way, because of this invariance, we just call the degree of um, f simply as a degree of f instead of referring to a particular regular value since we know it's independent of that. So um, let's suppose we have an open subset of Rm and a vector field on A. And let C be a isolated critical point of the vector field V. So I should actually say what I mean by isolated critical point here. By isolated, I mean that there exists some epsilon greater than 0 such that if I take my vector field V and restrict it to this um, open neighborhood of radius epsilon around C such that V restricted to some open neighborhood uh, and our notation is also V. I apologize for this. It's V subscript epsilon C. This is the open disk around the point C of radius epsilon such that V, which is a vector field, does not vanish anywhere, um, and let's even say the closed unit ball. So let's say, let's take the closure of this. Does not vanish anywhere except at C. So an isolated point, we know what a lot of these examples look like. Maybe a source, for instance, where the vector fields emanate from some origin. And let's say they get smaller as you get closer to the origin. 
and it vanishes at the center. Or maybe something where you have like a flow in one direction. Maybe something like You might have some weird flows like this. Or you might have, again, something concentric. You might have a, a something that looks like it's generated by rotations. And at the origin, you have a, a vanishing point. All of these are examples where I can find an open neighborhood around the critical point at which the vector field doesn't vanish at any point inside of this closed unit ball. So if I have such an isolated critical point of a vector field V, we can actually look at this disk around the critical point, and the boundary of this disk is going to be some sphere. Now, the sphere has a natural orientation on it because it's a subset of Euclidean space. And we have a vector field that restricts to that sphere. So what we can do is define the index of V at C. And this is, this is the degree of the function, which is defined on the boundary of this epsilon neighborhood. And it maps to a sphere of the same dimension. In this case, it's an m minus 1 dimensional sphere. And what it assigns is to every point x, it takes the vector field at that point and rescales it so that we know that it doesn't vanish. And when you rescale it, we just make sure that it lies on the unit sphere. So we take v, x, and then we rescale it. And now you see why we require that it doesn't vanish, because then otherwise this might not be even well defined. And because this vector field is assumed to be smooth, if you assume it's smooth, this function is also smooth because it's the quotient of two smooth functions. So the index of a vector field at a point is this, is the degree of this map, of this function. And remember, this is oriented because it's a sphere. It's just that it's a sphere of radius epsilon at the point C. And this is also a sphere. And both of them have natural orientations as subsets of Euclidean space. And so it makes sense to talk about the degree of this map. And then you can ask, OK, well, what are the degrees of all of these different vector fields? And we'll talk about examples in the next video lecture.